Just kidding. You guys are still minors. I think. That's not what I wanted. It is what I wanted. All right, are the slides visible? Did I see one head nod? Okay. We are beginning chapter two. Chapter two is an in-depth examination of how we became a constitutional democracy. You will really want to pay attention to this chapter because it is the it is the foundation for your report. If you noticed when we were when we were just looking at the assignments, there's a brief over chapter three, there's a brief over chapter four, there's a brief over chapter five. There's no brief over chapter two because that's what the report is over. There's no brief over chapter one because that's the discussion. So you want to focus in and take note on this chapter for the purposes of your report. Which the report is about our journey of how we went from uh, being subjects to England to a constitutional democracy. Pretty self-explanatory. Let me just remind you that we are not a pure democracy. We have a constitution. Written in what year? Anybody? Anybody for a thousand professor points? Isn't it 1785? Eh, thanks for playing, but good try. Wait, what was the question again? Can you repeat it? <laughs> the year that the constitution was written you said 1785 correct yeah yeah i said yeah. 1787. it wasn't 85 but you're close 1787 1787 a thousand points too is that cheyenne yes sir okay 17 and 87. And the Constitution defined, it put limits upon, and it gave to uh, It, it, yeah, defined, it limited the government, and it is our fundamental law. So democracy, which would be government by the people, if it was just the people, that would be basically majority rules. But with a constitution, there are limits on the power of government. And um, those are all spelled out in the Constitution with the Bill of, with, with the Bill of Rights added on. Um, it gave clear rights to individuals. 
and within those bill of rights the uh, it protects minority groups from the majority so it's a more sophisticated system than just pure democracy democracy that word i don't think it means what you think it means 5000 points to the one who can tell me what movie this is from it's an 80s movie and i am a child of the 80s this is making me sad Nobody's watched The Princess Bride. Where he says, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. The other guy kept saying, inconceivable. Anyway, America is a constitutional republic, not a democracy. All right. Any questions? I want you to take a few moments. Think of somebody in your life, family or friend, someone that you will see later today. And I want you to share or I want you to ask them. Do you realize that the United States of America is a constitutional republic and not a democracy? See how they respond. All right, no questions. <clears throat> As you begin to read chapter two, you will see that a constitutional democracy or a constitutional republic is characterized by being a limited government. Remember, the Constitution puts limits, but it's also a representative government where the majority of the people elect their representatives or officials. Where did that come from? Did Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers, did they just um, get together and have a brainstorming session and come up with this? No, they were influenced by, I'm going to make this a little bigger. They were influenced by some political philosophers. The main guy who influenced Jefferson was, was John Locke. Take note of John Locke. He is mentioned on page 30. You'll see him on the exam. But John Locke believed in this idea that we know of as a social contract. When it comes to politics, people who are the governed create a contract with those who govern them, the government. The government's duty is simply to protect the natural rights of the people. And as the government does that, the people in return give their consent to be governed. So that's the contract. 
we common citizens choose who will be our government leaders and we give them our consent. Yes, we choose you to lead. And those who we choose in essence say, we will protect the rights of you and we will represent you when the government assembles. John Locke was in turn influenced by a guy named Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes believed that he wanted to, in creating a science of politics, he believed that there that that politics needs to find the strongest or politics needs to be based on one indisputable truth or principle. And it needs to be based upon the strongest aspect of human nature. Now for Thomas Hobbes, human passion, not, not romantic passion, but the, uh, the ability of humans to feel very strongly about something. That is our strongest element and not reason. I think we would probably all agree with that, right? Most people operate and live their lives based on their feelings, not on reason, not on logic and clear thinking. So the strongest element in human beings was passion. What is the strongest passion that humans have? Tom Hobbes believed it was fear of dying violently. And so this fear gave rise to what he called self-preservation. This, this is a natural right that human beings have. We all have the right to live so that we protect ourselves, we preserve ourselves from, from violent death. And so he wrote a book called Leviathan that um, expounded on this natural right of self-preservation. And so that influenced Locke. People, and he was basing it on past experience in, in the European governments, people who, uh, you know, people feared the government when there was a dictator or a king or there was a small ruling class. People feared what they, what would happen to them. So Locke, based on Hobbes, came up with a social contract. And this is where Jefferson formulated that quote that I shared on Wednesday that when there is fear of the government, when people fear the government, there's tyranny, but when the government fears the people, there's liberty. So these are some of the influences on Jefferson and the founding fathers. These are not all the influences. There's, there's another guy named Rousseau. I think he was a, no, I'm thinking of Montesquieu. If you, if you enjoy the uh, National Treasure movies, uh, they're really good movies, even though, you know, I don't think, there was a Masonic conspiracy, but they do throw a lot of history in there about our government. And in the second movie, Benjamin Gates, played by Nicolas Cage, mentions Montesquieu being an influence of our government. So what I'm saying is Hobbes and Locke 
are not the only guys that influenced this social contract theory. And these, these uh, persons had the greatest influence on our government, our form of government. Again, the social contract theory says that people choose to give the state power, but the state's purpose is to protect their citizens and uh, promote their well being. So, a government of the people, we the people, not we the rich, not we the king and queen. Not we the military leaders, but we the people. So the Constitution was written in 1787, but before the Constitution was written, and you need to know these things for your report, there were two documents before the Constitution that are very important for our theory of government. The first one, the Declaration of Independence, a thousand points to the one who can tell me what year this was written. I'll give you a hint. Seventeen seventy six. Seventeen seventy six. Y'all like my shirt, the seventeen seventy six shirt. So, this is written eleven years before the Constitution, but this is not a this is not a written form of government. This is simply a declaration. In other words, an announcement. I think it's, um, well, you can read it in less than 10 minutes, but it's an announcement that we, the 13 colonies, uh, using the the old song from the 80s to paraphrase it we're not gonna take it anymore all right uh we're not gonna take it that's how it goes in case you're wondering that's what the declaration of independence is basically in a nutshell um thomas jefferson who wrote it who wrote it listed I believe there was 27 grievances. In other words, he said, um, you know, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for a people to break away from another people, but we don't want to do it just to do it. So let me spell out the reasons why. And then he gives 27 grievances against England. You've done this, you've done this, England has done this, you've done this. And so, seeing that there's a pattern of abuse, we are declaring that we're breaking away from England and we're gonna be independent. So, this is not a government document on how the new government is going to run. This is simply a declaration that we are breaking away from England. But these are some of the major themes, and we've touched on some of these, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, there are truths that are basically clear for everybody to see. I mean, they're evident. They're is the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. 
Today, we, we would understand that as all people are created equal, that there are natural rights, remember those, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are natural rights in that they were given to us by a creator, and they're not political rights that come from a government. Everybody is born with these rights. The purpose of government is therefore to secure or protect those rights. A government is not formed to enslave people and get rich, but a government should be, uh, the purpose of a government is to protect the natural rights of all people. Now, how do we, what is the mechanism that makes sure that the government does this? Well, they've got to understand that they are accountable to the people that they govern. The people who they govern are giving their permission, their consent to allow them to be the government leaders. Also in the, and this is what the name means, Declaration of Independence. Um, a people have a right to um, rebel against a government whenever that government is destructive of the natural rights. That's what Jefferson laid out in the Declaration. The King of England has done this. He has, he has put great taxes on us that have burdened us. He has put troops. He has put military troops in our cities. We have standing armies in our cities. He has denied us having a trial by a jury of our own peers, and he has forced us to go to England to have a, have a trial. And he just lists out these things. So it's a pattern. The King of England keeps abusing us. We have the right, therefore, to rebel. But we would not advocate straight anarchy. So there's limits to a rebellion or revolution. First of all, we've got to be wise or prudent. We're not just going to break away from any government simply for a silly reason. In other words, not a light reason or a transient reason. There's got to be serious, long-term reasons why a people would break away from a government. And then experience. People are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves. In other words, the tendency of humans is to accept the suffering as long as it's not too bad then to break away and form another government that would protect the rights. Because if basically what the, what the truth is behind that is that if we don't realize that the King of England continues to do these things, eventually he's gonna take away all of our rights and he's gonna make us slaves. And by then it'll be too late. So those are some of the major themes of the Declaration of Independence. Any questions? 
so the declaration is really more of a theoretical um, document than a practical government document. Um, and it's still very important because Abraham Lincoln uh, in his Gettysburg Address, he made reference to things that are in the Declaration of Independence. But I, I just want to make sure you understand that this was more of a theoretical document and it really didn't form a new government. It just basically declared we're breaking away from England. King George said, no, you're not. I'm sending troops over and you're coming back. And that's when the Revolutionary War started uh, in depth because even before the declaration, we had Concord and um, Lexington in 1775. The declaration was really written during the beginning stages of the Revolutionary War. Okay, no questions on that. So <clears throat> our first written government, as I shared before, was not the Constitution, but the Articles of Confederation. So you have George Washington. He is the supreme commander of our Continental Army. He is leading our army in the Revolutionary War, which started in 1775 and went all the way to 1783. So the Revolutionary War is going on, and Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So we actually had started war with England, but now we've officially broken off. And then shortly after that, we started having Continental Congresses, where each state would send some of their leaders to meet and basically try to give some kind of central power, not power, but some kind of a central, a centralization of organizing how the colonies are going to, you know, how the army is going to fight and what needs to be done and trying to get states to provide food and clothing for the army. So they start meeting and then they eventually realize we need to have some kind of government. And so they begin meeting with that specific purpose in mind. And in 1781, 1781, they complete the first written government document for our country, the Articles of Confederation. And the articles were in place until 1787. What happened in 1787 again? Bueller. Bueller, Fry. The Constitution. Right, the Constitution. So we had a government for six years before the present, the present government that we have now, which we've had now for 233 years.
What's the difference? You can see here that some of the some of the the um, key things that it did for the for the whole country was it helped to organize land that they had received with the Northwest Ordinance. It was uh, the government that was in place when we eventually defeated England and broke away from them completely. But after the war is over and the army goes home and they go back to their farms and their homes and their families, this is where the Articles of Confederation displayed its weakness because the articles weren't good for those two years that they were formed during the war 1781 to 1783 but now we've broken away from england we are independent we no longer need a standing army we no longer have to contribute money to pay the army to provide for them clothing and food so it, the congress basically works um on a i guess the best way i could say it is a part-time basis because the Articles of Confederation set up the government very different than the Constitution. For one thing, there was no president, no executive branch. There was no Supreme Court. You, you guys hopefully know that under our current constitution, we have the three branches of government, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. The president, the Supreme Court, and Congress. The Articles of Confederation had a Congress, and that's where all the power was. There really was no president, and there was no Supreme Court. And so Congress, the government, had no power to tax the states. The only thing they could do was ask the 13 states, would you please contribute some money? Would you please pay some taxes to help us run our government? And there were some states who never did. And so the government under the Articles of Confederation also had no power to regulate commerce, especially between states. Like, um, for example, Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island was a state known for um, their, their whaling their their whaling businesses their their fishing economy and if they wanted to send a shipment of fish or whale products uh to upstate new york and uh, new york was going to give them some lumber in exchange the government under the Articles of Confederation, they could not regulate that commerce between states or that trade so that things are pretty square. 
So you might have one state taking advantage of another. There was no common currency. That is, there was no, uh, there was no federal treasury uh, printing out one and five in $10 bills, $20 bills. Each state created their own money. And so if you traveled from New York to Pennsylvania, they might not take your money that's printed in New York. Also, uh, each state had one vote. So you guys know, right, that today every state in our country gets to elect two U.S. senators. Does anybody know who our two are? Wasn't one of them like Kevin Stitt? Kevin Stitt is our governor. Oh wait. Yeah. These are these are senators to the United States Congress. In other words, these are these are people that would live in Washington part of the year and then have an office in Oklahoma. Is one of them in Hoff? Yes, James Inhoff. Um, you know, if any of you guys are familiar with uh, the Baptist Camp Falls Creek, the other one used to be the director of Falls Creek. His name is James Lankford. So every state gets to pick two U.S. senators, but then um, we don't all get to send the same amount of U.S. representatives. For example, Oklahoma, we have six representatives, but a state with more people like California, they have like uh, 30 representatives. And then a smaller state like, um, now this is population wise, but a smaller state like Montana has three senators, I believe. Now that's under our that's under our current constitution, but under the Articles of Confederation, every state simply got one vote. So you would have Little Rhode Island getting one vote, just like Virginia, which had a lot of people. So every state got to send one congressman to the Continental Congress. And there were only 13 votes on any issue. And you had to have nine states approve of something to get something passed. So that really, in a sense, that gave the smaller states like Rhode Island and Connecticut, that gave them more influence than the states that had more people. Let's say they wanted to pass something. Let's say they wanted to pass a tax that would, um, you know, after the war, there were a lot of veterans who uh, had lost their farms and they, they didn't ever get, they didn't get paid their full wages. So let's say in 1784, for example, they wanted to pass a tax so that they could pay all the veterans. And let's say that the first 12 states, eight states said yes and four states said no. And let's say the 13th and deciding state was Rhode Island. If Rhode Island said no, then they would not get the nine votes. And therefore one little state would determine if all the veterans got that pay bonus or whatever. That's just an example of how a little state could have so much power. So these are the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Now this next piece of information is, is strictly for uh, your trivial pursuit or jeopardy knowledge. 
but the first president of our country was George Washington. Samuel Huntington. Woohoo! If you count the Articles of Confederation. Because, yes, George Washington is known as our first president under the Constitution. But for those six years when we had the Articles, even though there was not an office of president, there still had to be a leader of the Congress, and that person was called the President of the United States in Congress Assembled. And the first man to do that was Samuel Huntington of Connecticut. So, this is the kind of question that might be like a bonus on the test. And plus you can impress your friends who say, of course, George Washington was the first president. And you can say, well, actually a guy by the name of Samuel Huntington, anyway, we're going to close by saying that in 1787, Congress met to originally revise the articles because of all these weaknesses. No president no executive agencies, no Supreme Court, there's no way to get tax money, there's no army funding, no Navy funding. We really can't deal with foreign countries because we really don't have the authority, we can't trade. So let's meet to revise the articles. But what they decided to do instead was let's scrap it and start over. And so we will begin Monday morning fresh with the Constitutional Convention and the beginnings of our present U.S. Constitution. Any questions? So whenever someone talks about George Washington and you want to impress him, remember Samuel Huntington. Don't say Sam Adams. He's the beer guy. But Samuel Huntington. All right. Have a great weekend, friends. And uh, we will uh, look forward to Monday morning with a new Bull Moose Monday leadership lesson from TR and tackle the Constitution.